All right, all right, all right. <clears throat> Let's get fired up here. Maximum freedom. Read. Stay on target. Maximum freedom. Stay on target. Maximum freedom. Read Rothbard. <laughs> oh, shit. Hello and welcome to the next episode of the Actual Anarchy Podcast, the podcast where we talk about movies from a Rothbardian anarcho-capitalist perspective. My name is Daniel and my co-host is Robert, and today we're going to talk about 13 Assassins, among uh, a few other things. So how you doing, Robert? Oh man, I love talking about ass. And we're going to double up and talk about ass assassins. It's going to be wonderful. Yeah, and you know, I... Daniel and I watched this movie in the thing about jigs. Yeah, my in my shitbox office. <laughs> So I was going to introduce you as Rorbit, actually, and I, I failed to do that. So my co-host, Rorbit, everyone, uh, Robert, hey, everybody. was <laughs> up here hanging out. We did three, 310 to Yuma in person, and my girls hung out and started calling him Rorbit because they can't say Robert, and so I think that's a good name. I think it'll stick. I fucking love it. They're, they're super cute, and when they call me Rorbit, I couldn't help but just smile every time, so it was awesome. Yeah, they were, they, were, they were sad uh, that you left, and um, when we were putting them down to a, for bed tonight, they were like, are you going to go talk to Robert or Robert? And I'm like, yep, we're doing a show tonight, girls. <laughs> so <laughs> I guess they say hi. Hey, I had a good time with the, with the, with the family, with the Daniel, and uh, hope to see them all again soon. All right, I'll be sure to play this hey, for Daniel them. Daniel actually uh, kidnapped me for a couple of days, maybe do a bunch of work. But he plied me with many drinks and helped me get fat. So I guess it was a yeah, it's a win lose trade off. It's fine. Can't win for losing. So let's do Thirteen Assassins. This is a movie that we we did watch up here, and it is on the Voodoo service, which we are now able to promote on our Tip Jar page. Halfway down the page, you'll see a, a link to Voodoo. We're now an affiliate for Voodoo. This movie was a pretty cool, like action Japanese wait, movie wait, 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 wait. from 2010. We're we're officially shilling for Voodoo because we've been unofficially shilling for Voodoo for some time now. So now yeah, we're officially we, doing. So, so that's the thing that that's how I got all this new affiliate stuff that I was talking about in the pre-show because I was yeah. like, we're already shilling for Voodoo, but we're getting approximately dick for doing that. So yeah. how do we, you know, get like eleven shekels? And I looked around and found these networks of, you know, marketplace type things where you can ma- marry up advertisers with content providers, and here we are. So now we're shilling for for big Voodoo. What a wonderful world we live in. All right, continue, Daniel. Yeah, so if, if anyone signs up on that Voodoo link, we'll make, you know, 12 cents, 14 cents, I don't even know. But do check it out. Voodoo is a pretty cool service. HD movies on your tablet, phone, computer, TV, whatever. They're super cheap. They're running sales all the time. It's part of Walmart. And uh, if you've got a whole collection of DVDs, you can um, tra- transfer them into the service for just a couple of bucks each. In fact, when Robert came up here, he brought a, a box of, what, a uh, hundred or so DVDs, and we put a bunch of them into our into our Voodoo account. Yes, we did. So thank you for doing that. Yeah, you're welcome. I know. I, I, I schlepped them all the way up to your place because you requested them. Uh, I schlepped them all the way over from where I was, and hopefully we'll get to, yeah, do some of those fine movies for some of you fine folks. It'll be good. Yeah, yeah, it's a good collection. I mean, you haven't bought a, a movie in like 10 years, but that's fine. I mean, <laughs> we're not like hip and on the scene. We're doing the, the older stuff for sure. Yeah, yeah. Uh, we do some new stuff, but mostly classics, you know, cult classics, stuff that people remember from days gone by, looking at it with uh, new fresh eyes, That's like right. we have. Uh, you know, probably saw those movies back when we were status, and then watch them again as non-status, and uh, things look a little bit differently. Yeah, usually not as good. <laughs> yeah, usually way more shitty, but, you know, that's the way it goes. Yeah, Don't we kind of We ruin things a little bit. Oh, yeah. So let's let's talk about yeah, this I one. Can't. All right. We have to. Let's do it. Let's do this. All right. So this is going to be uh, actualanarchy.com slash 38, everyone. That's the show notes page for this one, 13 Assassins. And here's the Google information. It's a 2010 drama thriller, two hours and 21 minutes, 96% Rotten Tomatoes. People are loving this thing. 
Uh, Ebert, when he was around, gave it a three and a half stars. This is a remake of a 1963 film based on historical events. Shin Simone Shimada leads a team of assassins in 19th century Japan to eliminate the ruthless nor- lord Naritsugu Matsudara. I'm totally saying that wrong. <laughs> Naritsugu all of Japan. Masudara, who is wreaking havoc against his own people, hired secretly by a government official hoping to end Masudara's reign of terror, Shimada recruits the best samurai in Japan and then sets a trap for the Lord's large contingent of faithful bodyguards. And that is the Google description, everyone. Uh, box office, $17.5 million. So probably a limited release type deal. Um, this is probably a film that is more cult classic, I guess, or um, very niche. People are into this sort of thing and enjoy it and seek it out. And uh, I thought it was good. I, I enjoyed this movie. Uh, your thoughts so far, Robert, on the Google description and just initial stuff? Yeah, so you're right. This is uh, one, of, one of those movies that gets brought over and with the limited release, something that made a lot of money in Asia and then comes over here and the the anime nerds and maybe some Japan, Japanese cinema files uh, will watch it. But the majority of people don't want to sit in a theater and read subtitles. Um, but there are certain people that will subject themselves to that, like we did uh, recently in your shipping container office. And um, I enjoyed it. Uh, watching it, you really get a sense for just how different yet how similar um Western culture is to Eastern culture. I keep, I mean, this is a big time in this world. If you're listening to this 10 years from now, maybe it's not such a big issue, but in the news today, there's all sorts of like culture issues and wars. Like everyone's calling everybody else a Nazi, or at least the left is really calling the right a Nazi a lot <laughs> lately, um, for talking about culture and the importance of culture. And there's, um, among the right and especially the alt right, they seem to be just really in love with Western culture and how wonderful and superior it is to everybody else and how it's a a culture of freedom and traditional of whatever. And there is certainly a great deal of lip service paid to freedom, no doubt about it. Um, But if you even take the most cursory of glances, you will realize how quickly you are not free. How many, how much government permission you need to do the most basic of things from getting a job to crossing the street, to driving a car, to fishing, to building a house, to, I mean, just the list is endless of, of things you need government permission to do. So the idea that we live in some sort of a free country or a free Western society that values freedom is a big fat fucking joke to me. Now, if you're going to compare Western society in the United States and whatever to say like Sharia law or North Korea, then sure, I grant you, there are differences. I mean, you're basically, I think Dave Smith compared North Korea to as a hostage situation recently. And I think that's a fairly apt comparison. But just because North Korea and Saudi Arabia and whatnot, Sharia law is a complete shit show, doesn't mean that Western civilization isn't also a shit show in terms of freedom. So when I was watching this movie, 13 Assassins, I was struck by the characters and how much they just blindly obeyed authority. And I'm sitting there going, man, this is like so much different than Western society. People don't do that, right? People wouldn't just blindly obey authority and protect this psychopathic murderer and all this crap. But then I'm like, wait a minute. Yes, they do. They do all the time. They're doing it right now. People blindly obey the president or their local official or the law. Um, now, it's interesting with the Donald Trump situation. There's a little bit of that veneer peeled away, and there's a whole lot of not my president business going on, and that's somewhat positive, but they just want a different person in the throne instead of the Trump person in the throne. But even then, there's a whole lot of, well, my boss said it, or my, my authority figure said it, so I have to do it. Soldiers go and they obey. Um, so that was my initial takeaway, that big, long, rambling thing that I just did. Um, the differences between the 13 assassins and the Western society, but actually a whole lot of similarities. Yeah, I can see that. I can see that for sure. And, and to your point, there is a little bit of resistance to Trump, but, but not for anything he's really doing. It's just for who he is, right? Because he's doing pretty much the same stuff Obama was doing. He was doing the same stuff George W. Bush is, was doing. I mean, 
with a yeah. slight different flavor, right? A little bit different rhetoric. Right, exactly. What he's doing, people are still blindly obeying to, but yeah, how he's saying it, they're like taking offense to. Like, if you're going to have me go murder a bunch of people, or if you're going to go murder a bunch of people, at least say nice things first, I guess. It makes it okay. Yeah, say, say you're doing it for the kids, for the children. Like, Madeleine Albright killed half a million right. Iraqi dead kids, and, and it was like, oh, yeah, it was worth it. Totally worth it. Yeah, so it's worth it, man. Yeah, so... That was what I, I was taking away, because, yeah, in the movie, there's this psychopathic, like, um, son of the Shogun, and he's, like, still a high-ranking politician, but he's not quite the Shogun yet or anything like that. But he still has, he's still a high-level gangster politician guy, and he's got this whole guard of troops and money and power, and he just sees himself as, what, like, some sort of a, I got the feeling that he felt of himself as some sort of, like, a, a disciplinarian and that the people that he was supposed to represent were people that he felt he needed to discipline and teach and murder because reasons. I mean, did you get a real sense that he was just some psychopath, or did you see that as a um, a fundamental disconnect of what power does to a person's brain? Because, I mean, yeah, he was a bad guy, that he went and killed people, but he actually killed people himself. Not that he was ever in any real danger, really. I mean, he's stabbing people in the back and shooting people with arrows who were just helpless, tied up. But other than acting on his own accord, there's no real difference between him and any other politician. I mean, one person enacts a law that kills a bunch of people or impoverishes millions of people, but he goes and shoots someone with arrows. I mean, they're both pieces of shit in my book. One does it with one level removed or a couple levels removed. Therefore, it seems like he's not really the cause of the thing, but of course he is. He's the ultimate cause of it. Not the proximate cause, but the ultimate cause. Yeah, I think he was a, a bored guy. He wanted to be in danger. He wanted to have a rush, like a thrill. Like he had kind of this boring life, and he was very sadistic and, and a psychotic guy. Uh, yeah. He was says here he was the half-brother of the Shogun, so he was protected and basically allowed to get away with doing these violent rapes and tortures and murders of people just at will. Like he could just do it. And uh, the Shoguns, who were serving him had this, I guess, minor dilemma in that they were sworn servants to the guy and their loyalty was such that no matter what he did, they had to obey him. Uh, otherwise, they would be dishonored or uh, I'm not sure exactly how the culture works, but it's like a, a, like you were talking about Western and, and Eastern cultures a little bit different. I think that they take obedience and um, what's the right word? Um, saving face or making sure that you're doing what's expected is, is a much higher on their value scale. I'm sort of, I'm totally butchering this, <laughs> but you, you, you get what I'm saying, right? Like honor is a big deal for them and, and following yeah, orders. It's right. It, 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 it's so important to them. Um, and I was going to say that, yeah, this, this guy's a piece of shit and he, he definitely saw these other people that he was killing as less than him, less than human, like dehumanized. He, he kept calling them like monkey people or hill people and, whatever, and like their necks are hard to chop off because they're hill people or hill monkeys or whatever. Anyway, yeah, what you're saying about the honor. So they have this such a strong sense of honor. Like if they feel that they are breaking that honor or violating that honor in any way, they would rather kill themselves than live with that dishonor. And that honor, it's like, how do you even so ingrained? It's, it's, it's a form of what? Social, social norms, right? Social control where clearly you don't need you don't need some sort of authority hierarchy type situation because everybody's going to be so wanting to conform to this kind of collective thing. It's a, it's, I'm not, I'm kind of butchering it too. Um, how do we even put it? It's, it's a, it's like a hyper social norm um, where it's the most important thing. Like you said, with the higher, higher value scale placed upon um, social conformity, but then the government politicians come in and kind of like hijack that and say, hey, you believe in social conformity. Okay, so also included in the social conformity is obedience to your Lord and that sort of thing. And so anytime you disobey him, it's like the ultimate heresy, and you would rather die than do that. Right, so, and rather than really do control. anything about it, they would they would uh, show disdain or protest by committing seppuku, by killing themselves. So I'll just read part of the plot here. Um, 1844 in Japan, Tokugawa shogunate is in decline, and uh, Naritsugu of the Akashi rapes, tortures, and murders his citizens at will. 
He's shielded, shielded because the Shogun is his half-brother. Uh, the Shogun's justice realizes that the situation will escalate after Naritsugu ascends to a higher political position. After a wronged party um, publicly commits seppuku as a way of showing disdain for Lord Nar- Naritsugu, Sir Doi seeks out a trusted older samurai, Shimada Shinzaman, who served under the former Shogun and secretly hires him to s- assassinate the guy. And... Um, Naritsugu's loyal retainers, led by Hanbei, an old contemporary of Shinzaman, learn of the plot by spying on Doi's meetings, and then it's like this um, chess match. There's a lot of uh, gamesmanship going on as they're plotting and, and counterplotting to to kind of set this uh, set this trap to finally assassinate this guy. Yeah, it's these two old um, samurai who both serve their different lords, and it's really based on who each of that person is and their personalities and and how that they're going to approach this problem. The one guy who has to defend his lord, even though he knows he's a piece of shit, he still, that's his identity is all tied up in this servitude. So he can't even imagine breaking that. Like to do, to do, to, to dis, to dishonor his lord is like the most unthinkable thing. So when his lord is actually physically in trouble, they like, it's like secret service style. They just jump in front of the arrows and do everything they can to throw their bodies away like garbage to protect this piece of shit and it's really really disgusting um it happens all the time even today um but it's really really gross um yeah so um i you know it's interesting because i i believe in self ownership so if if this person wants to throw their life away for some belief that they have high on their value scale who am i to say that it's wrong but at the same time I look at this kind of collectivistic attitude and this sort of belief in authority as the most dangerous thing, right? So it's almost like they're under some sort of a mind control. And that's, and that's one of the things that we really, like they've been attacked by this virus and then we're trying to break them out of this, this cult. And that's one of the things that we kind of talked about at the, the candles in the dark event. So yeah, I mean, on, on the one hand, I, I respect the guy, I guess, their choices in life. But at the same time, I think that they've been duped and they're believing lies and they're throwing away their life, you know, for, for a piece of garbage. Uh, do you have any of those kind of conflicting ideas, Daniel, like, or of conflicting feelings about it? Like, on the one hand, I want to respect someone else's ideas about what they value in life. Like, I, I value service to this person above all other things. Fine. You want to do that? You go do that over there. That's, you can do your business, buddy. At the same time, I'm going, but you're just like totally brainwashed, buddy. I mean, how 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 could your life be garbage and worthless or best served in service to this horrific piece of shit? That, that doesn't make any sense to me. Yeah, you know I think they've, they've got to have a, a high degree of cognitive dissonance going on because on the one hand, they've got this honor thing and it's like hyper important, like you were saying. But on the other hand, he can plainly see that this guy is doing awful atrocities, violent acts, murdering, raping, pillaging right in front of him and and he's standing by protecting him and I don't know if I'd give him a pass on well it's his choice to do that I mean it's his choice to participate to collude in this activity like he's an accomplice you know I think that you're you're, you're holding him guilty of a crime I think that he aids and abets in this guy's uh, atrocities for sure yeah he allows it to happen okay well I was he protects it I was I was specifically talking about throwing his life away for the guy but I think you're also right I mean do you do you respect his choice in basically sacrificing himself to save this other person? Well, that's a, that's a different one, I think, because that's part of being a shogun, right? Or not a shogun, but a, um, uh, what are they? They're, uh, samurai. Samurai, yeah. That's like, to be a samurai means that you must obey and that, uh, your best hope is to die in battle, right? To get an honorable death or something along those lines. And so, that it's so high on their scale that they'll do anything to get it. And so I think once they've kind of become this um, samurai, at least as depicted in the movie, that was his number one goal was to see that, see that through. Like he trained his whole life to do this. And these guys are like older guys by the time this, you know, movie happens, right? They're probably in their fifties. So they've, they've been in the samurai system their whole lives. Yeah. And this is, to be fair, this is a, during a time when which the samurai are declining. If you've ever seen the movie, the last samurai, that, I think that happens somewhat later, but there is a time in Japan, Japanese history where the samurai were like the warrior class and they were seen as like gods and not necessarily gods, but like they were like the supreme thugs, like cops, kind of 
kind of god figures where you kind of have to bow and scrape before them or else if you don't show them proper respect they could like kill you without without consequence kind of like cops today mm. and then and then as and then that kind of kind and then especially as the western influence came in and the the arms from Europe and the United States came in then they were definitely even more on the decline but anyway um so they're kind of like in this movie they see their lives kind of not having a purpose right like there's this is during the um oh, I forget the name of the the period but you're saying it's like the Tokugawa shogunate yeah, it says Tokugawa, uh, United. the Edo, Edo period. Okay, so this is the time when all the different um, factions of Japan, like the United Japan, right? So this is a time of peace. And samurai were warriors. So, you know, they didn't really have a purpose. So I could see them as like you, what you were saying. They're trained their whole life, and they don't really see a way in order to get this noble death. So here's the, kind of this opportunity presents itself. Then you, they're like, yeah, this is it. I want to do this. I want to go out swinging so yeah so for me if you find if this is your goal in life then i'm not going to sit here and say that that's wrong to die trying to save somebody or to do a thing like that um but to your point that this guy was a piece of shit murderer and they are aiding and abetting the guy they're complicit they're absolutely guilty of <laughs> yeah they're absolutely guilty of that um just because it's your life goal to serve a murdering piece of trash doesn't mean it's right for sure so you're you're sort of drawing a distinction here between choosing to obey somebody as part of being a samurai is one thing, but then helping him and, and protecting him in doing these evil things. Like, what was the one thing, this is kind of interesting, like that kind of kicks off this whole um, Shinzaman deciding, yeah, okay, I'm going to assassinate this guy, because they showed what this um, Naritsugu had done to a, to a woman. Yeah, he had chopped her arms and ripped her tongue out and legs off and all kinds of horrible things. Right, and just used her as like a, a sex toy thing and then threw her away. And yeah. then she makes a, um, they ask her, you know, what happened to your family, what happened to your village? And she, using her, her mouth, paints the words total massacre. Yeah. And and that's where Shinzaman's like, all right, this guy's got to go. <laughs> like, this this guy is so evil, we got to put him down. Yeah. And now and here, here he is making this moral choice, right? Because he also is a, a raised samurai. Like his whole wor- his whole life has been to obey, to have this blind obedience to his emperors, betters, whatever you know, the the higher class. And here he is making a decision, uh, which I think I think is powerful. It's very good. It's like someone's disobeying. Somebody's looking beyond simply the accolades and the honor and the um, caste you know, the system, right? They're looking outside of it. Right, to see and make a claim, proclamation that my morality trumps that, and I am correct. Right, because exactly. It, because in the long, in the, in the history of humanity, civilization, if you will, the, um, the so-called leaders have always claimed some sort of divine right, that there's a reason why they have the right to rule, and it's always been like, well, I'm descended from the gods, or whatever, something like that, or I am a god. And the Japanese were no different. Um... They very much, like the emperor even today, among, I assume, some Japanese, I know specifically in World War II, just because a lot of American history focuses on what Japan was doing in World War II. This is why I know a fair amount about it, or at least from the American side of things, um, in that, yeah, Hirohito, Hirohito was very much seen as sort of a kind of a god figure. Um, there's a, just like almost a religious figure, and that how could he possibly be wrong about anything? Um, because of that connection to God. And so once you establish that politicians are God, then, yeah, disobeying them would be heretical. And so, yeah, to your point, Shinsamon is basically saying, no, my morality trumps this divine right of these people to rule and that this is wrong. What he's doing is wrong, and I have to put a stop to it. So, yeah, it is a powerful statement, especially in this, well, this or any culture, really. Yeah, yeah. So, and he goes about doing this by gathering additional samurai to like help him in this mission. And their yep. plan is to ambush Naritsugu as he's making his official journey back from uh, Edo, which is now present day Tokyo, uh, back to his um, homeland of Akashi. And I think this is kind of cool. In the long, yeah. Mm-hmm. There's a series of, um, you know, cat and mouse and gamesmanship going on, like we we're alluding to earlier. And they determine that this guy's got a follow tradition and he's got to pay proper respects to various clans so they they 
wager that he's going to visit this clan and then this clan and then this other clan so he can kind of plot where his path is going to take him. And because he was um, so evil and committed some um, a rape and a murder of, of one of the clan's um, people, they were able to convince... His son. It was the clan leader's son and his daughter-in-law. Right. So they were able to get him to say, uh, this dude cannot travel through my land. So that forced Naritsugu to, to travel this other direction going through a town that uh, Shinzaman was able to buy and set a trap within the town, like building up collapsible walls and spikes and um, boulders to fall down and dynamite, like just a bunch of crazy, you know, like contraptions that they would lure these guys into the town and then just raise hell and destroy them. Because there's, what, 600 um, men in the Naritsugu, like cadre in, in their you know, little traveling band uh, of murderers. There were, two, there were, two, there were 200. At first they said 75, but then they were like, oh, okay, no, 200 or 70. Then it was 200. But watching the movie, it seemed like more like as many as were needed because they just kept coming and kept coming. And it seemed a lot like more like more than 200. Yeah, I, I, it, what, it did seem like more than 200 because I'm like, wait, that guy, the du- the sword dude who was badass, like he just chopped up like 35 yeah. guys. And all of a sudden there's 100 more. <laughs> you know, it was like, <laughs> it was crazy. And then uh, all of a sudden there's like no, none left. It's like there's a swarm of them, and then eventually the assassins, the 13 guys, get you know killed off one by one. And one of them is like this hunter guy, right? This like crazy wild hunter guy. Uh, yep. And then the the spigot dries up, and there's no more of these guys. And then there's Naritsugu and this um, what's the guy's name? Who's his uh, his protector dude? I don't, uh, know, I don't remember H- his name. Hanbei. But yeah, he was, yeah, that's right. Hanbei. He's his uh, yeah chief of staff, essentially samurai dude, protector dude. Yeah, so it says here the town was converted into an elaborate maze of booby traps and camouflaged fortifications. When Naritsugu and his um, group arrived, the numbers had been swelled with additional troops, so they had the 75 up to 200. And the 13 assassins are no longer uh, facing just 70 men. Now they face the 200. A lengthy battle follows with Naritsugu and his guards trapped inside the village and attacked on all sides by arrows, explosives, knives, and swords. With the exception of Koyota, who fights with rocks and slings, that's the hunter guy. I just want to point out, they say lengthy battle. They are not joking. It's about an hour screen time, that battle. It's most of the movie. Yeah, and I think it's most of the appeal to the movie. I think at least for um, that niche audience that we were talking about before. I mean, the story is interesting, of course, and it's got that gamesmanship going on. But yeah, people are here for the sword fights and the and the blowing up and the you know the action. Yeah, and I appreciate that there were you know 13 of them and they're going up against you know 200. But there were some questionable things like so they get them all trapped in this or town of death. And then they start unloading on them with, you know, dynamite, and then they're picking them off with bow and arrow. And then they get, you know, like, I think I forget what they said. There's like either 70 of them killed or 130 of them killed or whatever it was, the number was. And then they were like, okay, let's go, let's go fight them hand to hand now. Like, there's 13 of them, and they're still getting outnumbered 10 to 1 at least or something like that. And they're just like, yeah, bring it on. It's like, okay. It's fun. I don't know how realistic it would have been, but it was it was fun. Yeah, it was weird because they still had a bunch of arrows and a bunch of other traps to set off, and I would have been like, all right, use all that stuff while you have the advantage, <laughs> and and, yeah. and then yeah, then get use down up there all and clean that stuff. Up. Yeah, fire till your all your arrows are gone. What what why the why they need to be all like hyper masculine, manly? Look, I'm going to take on 20 guys at once, kind of a thing. I mean, there wasn't except for the one main sword badass super killer guy. I think they did a pretty decent job of showing that, you know, they're not like the most amazing swordsmen ever. They're they're killing their opponent, but they're not just standing their ground. I mean, they're running away and hacking at them and getting them in a trap and running away and just barely staying alive. Um, so that was that was pretty good. But, yeah, I would have liked them to exhaust their strategic opportunities before going down and uh, duking it out. But, of course, you know. Uh, the script said they had to do it, so they had to do it. So whatever. Yeah, it's one of our tropes. It's in the script. <laughs> yeah. But uh, uh, interestingly, uh, Naritsugu, he was happy to be in this battle. Like, it, this is excitement for the first time in his life. And he even tells uh, his second-in-command guy, he's like, you know, if I ever get on the Shogun's Council, I'm going to bring back wars, because this is awesome. Yeah, yeah. So like I was saying earlier, this is a time of peace in Japan, relatively, anyway. I mean... Whatever, but you know, not just clan on clan fighting all the time. It's kind of like Pax Romana style piece. And yeah, the guy is like so bored his whole life, 
and then he's actually thrown into this life or death situation, and he's just fascinated and just loving it. Yeah, and they're like all trying to protect him, and they're like, "Oh, go over here, man. Go, you know. Oh, this is a trap." And he's like, "Oh, this is a trap. Sweet, I'm gonna go right into the trap." <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's like so disconnected from actual human experiences that he's willing to throw himself into life and death situations just for the thrill of it. Yeah, you know, and I'm I'm gonna bring this um, back. This Hanbei guy, he reminded me of. Charlie Prince in 310 to Yuma. This blind devotion, the guy that he's serving can do no wrong, even though he does evil shit. Uh, I see a a pretty big parallel, and that was the movie we just did um, for episode 37. Yeah, except I think in 310 to Yuma, Charlie Prince was portrayed as the more evil of the characters um, because Russell Crowe's character was seen as having some sort of code or conscience or something like that, even though he was just as much of a killer as Charlie Prince was, if probably more so, but we didn't get to see that on screen. Yeah, yeah, you're right. Yeah, Prince was more of just, well, Prince was like this Narisugu guy. Like, he was just killing for the sake of killing. Yeah. Yes, yeah, so I guess right. the roles would be slightly reversed, but the positions uh, would remain the same. So this Hyundai guy would be like Russell Crowe, who still has, you know, some code of honor that he's trying to fulfill. And I would have thought that once um, Narisugu told him, hey, I'm going to bring back war because, you know, this is awesome. I love death and destruction, that Hyundai would turn at that point and be like, you know what? Fuck you, dude. <laughs> Yeah, well, that was the one thing we kept talking about throughout the whole movie was, hey, why doesn't one of these guys, one of his crew, one of these 200 guys just be like, recognize the horror of a person that this person is and just put him down like a rabid dog, do everybody a favor. But I mean, you know, I mean, in there is a kind of a parallel and I'll give credit to the um, soldiers in Vietnam. Okay, I know there are stories of platoons of men who would recognize that. Uh, they'd get in there, and they would recognize that this guy was going to get them all killed. You know, there's something wrong with him, he's a piece of shit, or he was crazy and wild, or whatever, for whatever reason, and they would just, they'd just kill him. They would just recognize that this guy was no good, and they would get rid of them. Um, probably because, you know, they're put in this life or death situation, and they, the only way they see a way out of it is to get rid of him. Um, so it's a little bit on the different side. Uh, I don't know why I'm trying to draw a parallel here. Sorry if I'm screwing this all up, but um, I just wanted to maybe give some credit to maybe Western culture since I was shitting on it earlier um, in the idea that maybe, you know, leaders aren't the, they're just people. Okay. They're just, they're just people and they're fallible and you get people in positions of power and they turn into pieces of shit. If they aren't that already, and it attracts people that are pieces of shit that want to rule and thug and power over other people. And um, yeah, Daniel. No, I think that was a good kind of like meandering rant actually. <laughs> but yeah, they they are just people, and they are fallible. And as Lord De- Lord Acton said, uh, power corrupts, and absolute power corrupts absolutely. And you can th- you can see examples of that all over the place, but especially in this uh, in this movie with this Narutsugu guy who you know was going for shits and giggles by raping and murdering and getting into this war, this battle, and enjoying every moment of it uh, so much that he yeah, wanted could- to go to war even after this. Yeah, you could tell that he didn't give one tenth of a shit about any of the people that were throwing his lives away, their lives away for him. Um, he didn't see them as human beings. He saw yeah, them even, as- even Hanbei, who was like so loyal, like his second in command, you know, looking up to the guy. When Shinzaman kills Hanbei, um, Naritsugu just kicks his head, his severed head away. Yeah, yeah, after he had, yeah, tried to save him. To save him, he you know, kicks his worthless head away, and he's like, Psh, whatever, garbage. And that's that's the, I mean, I want to say that that is something that happens with collectivism, the dehumanization, but it it happens all the time in non, maybe maybe, I mean, well, all governments is a form of collectivization, and they dehumanize their enemies all the time. Um, de- I don't know, I haven't really thought about this before, so I shouldn't just be spouting off, but it seems to me that when you you think of the collective first and of the individual second, that you are by necessity dehumanizing the individual and devaluing the individual in reference to the collective. And that just allows for all kinds of horrific atrocities. Because <laughs> if you're ever seen as an enemy of the collective, then yeah, you're garbage. You need to be put down and destroyed. Um, yeah, yeah that's exactly thought. how they do it too. I mean, people get labeled as subhuman or less than human or as, you know, some other group uh and and when it is a collective uh it's much easier to to make claims for the greater good you know but philosophically there is no collective per se it's still just individuals right like forest doesn't exist trees exist 
Right. And who's to say what the greater good is? You have to have some authority in order to claim it. And even then, is this, that's just one guy's opinion. I mean, it, it, it doesn't exist. The greater good doesn't exist. You're talking about a subjective value statement made by one person against the value statement of another person. And yeah. Yeah, there's really no way to measure it. <laughs> there's no way to know. Uh, but they make proclamations and, and this Naritsugu guy, I mean, he was the, he was the Lord, right? And he made a comment right after he kicked, um, Hanbei's head. He tells Shinzaman that the people and the samurai have only one purpose and that is to serve their Lord. Yeah. And that's, that, that probably, he's probably just echoing what he's been told by other people like him and then reinforced throughout his life by people bowing and scraping to him. So. Right. And it, uh, yeah, he, he's a monster, but he's a product of his environment. I mean, he wasn't born as that piece of a shit. He wasn't a little baby that was gonna, you know, that was already killing people. He, yeah, yeah. He, was, he wasn't. He wasn't baby Hitler. <laughs> he wasn't. He wasn't. Yeah. I mean, even baby Hitler wasn't baby Hitler. I mean, these are people that, yeah, they they would have had. I mean, he might be a psychopath or a sociopath. Someone. Many people who are um, harmed as children are. It's a way of disassociating with the the pain and being it's a defense mechanism to protect yourself but without a bunch of people bowing and scraping in front of him and doing whatever he says then he's not going to be a monster he can only do as much damage as he can do before somebody puts him down but instead you've got this culture of bowing and scraping to this godhead figure and he's able to do all these horrific atrocities so in the end as i always say as larkin has said the belief in authority as any kind of legitimate thing that is the true monster here um not to say that he's innocent i mean i still think he's guilty he's still doing it he owns himself and he needs to die <laughs> sorry but without the belief in authority he would only be able to do so much but with the belief in authority he's got people protecting him and bowing and scraping before him and reinforcing this horrific behavior and like you said aiding and abetting this behavior yeah and it seems like he was doing it because i mean perhaps growing up everything was done for him he didn't have to work for anything, he had servants everywhere. All of his wants were immediately satisfied, at least, you know, in the contemporary time of, the, of what, the early 1800s here, 1844. Right. Uh, yeah. So he could focus on other things. Like he got bored with this life. And so he sought out these horrors and wars and danger because he'd never, um, you know, he never had anything uh, outside of the norm growing up. I'm, I'm sort of, I'm totally guessing here, right? But it seemed like he had this, all my shit's taken care of, therefore I need to seek out something outside of this. Well, yeah, and he's never had to struggle. So he never had the appreciation for what it meant to struggle. So all these peasants that are, like, you know, barely scraping by and just living, he has no appreciation for any of their trials and tribulations. I don't to him, they're just playthings. Mm -hmm. I, 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 it's like, I don't know, there, there have been stories, and I can't think of one off the top of my head, where you got some privileged asshole and then he gets taken down a peg and then he is like, you know, he gets somebody that looks like him takes his place and then he's switched and now he's the poor guy and he has to see what it's like to live on the other side. You know what movies I'm talking about? There's movies like that where there's like a prince and he's got to look alike, a poor guy and they get switcheroo, the old switcheroo. Mm -hmm. So then yep. the prince has to see what it's like to live on the other side and he gains a new appreciation for the troubles of the people and he becomes a better person, blah, blah, blah. That's so yeah, I think story. you're saying that What's that? What movie? Uh, it's a pretty common one, but I was thinking of um, Trading Places. I, I think that's like a takeoff yeah. on that. That's pretty good. With yeah, Patrick there's Lloyd one and, for you. Uh, is it um, Beverly, Hill, Beverly Hills Cop guy? Uh, Eddie Murphy? Yeah. Yeah, Murphy and Eckrad are in that movie. Um, but there are other examples of that. Um, I want to say I don't want to say there's a Disney movie, but I mean anybody listening to this is probably screaming into their fucking phones. Like, hey, come on, you idiots! <laughs> <laughs> anyway, yeah, so. Yeah, this is a guy who's never had to struggle. He's always had his wants taken care of. So, yeah, he has no appreciation for the hard work that goes into those things coming into a being. And he also wasn't an Austrian economist. So, you know. Yeah, and I think that's why he can just totally dismiss the sacrifices that his servants are making or the people serving him. Because he's right. got hundreds, you know. He's been served his whole life, so he doesn't give a shit. And this is something that when my wife and I, we, you know, first had our kids, we're like, I can see how people become socialists because as a baby, you cry, somebody's there to try to deal with it. Are you hungry? You, you know, need some milk, you need your diaper changed, whatever. You're like, you, you, you elicit <laughs> responses from people taking care of you by whining. And it seems like you just fast forward 20, 30 years and keep doing the same shit and you're a Bernie supporter. You're uh, in this Antifa nonsense, you know? 
get out of your mom's basement yeah. after one in the afternoon and <laughs> go punch Nazis, right? Yeah, I, I, I wanted to bring this up kind of at the uh, Candles in the Dark thing, but I didn't think it would be really um, productive because, I mean, what are you arguing against? You're arguing against a family unit? I mean, that's that's a dumb argument to make, I suppose, probably. But, yeah, families reinforce socialist ideas just by the very fact of here you are responding to them whining for a thing and here you are giving it to them or, you know, getting everything for free. And so then, yeah, you you translate that from having parents to having a government and you get handouts from parents and you get handouts from the government. And it's people that aren't, yeah, they're not growing up and they're just making that transition from one embryonic experience to another. Yeah, and I, I feel like we're getting into some some weird territory here because we're talking about parenting. But um, since we were aware of this concept, and, and I don't even know if we were exposed to it or if we just thought of it on our own, we we're like, hey, this is kind of weird. So we actually, you know, go out of our way to make sure that our girls are learning that they need to work to provide value, to receive value. And so they're already doing chores at two years old and four years old, and they're earning money, and they're picking things that they want and they're saving up for, and we let them know, all right, you have this amount of money and this is how much the thing that you want is, and, you know, it's going to take a little bit more time to be able to earn enough to buy that. And then, you know, if, if you want to buy it, you can, or you could do other things with the money. You could save it, or you could buy this thing and this thing. And you know what the four-year-old said after she earned enough money to buy the thing she'd been wanting for over a month? She's like, oh, you know, I want to get that for my sister, hmm. which was like the cutest thing ever. And I don't know, I, I feel like we're, you know, we're making an effort to make sure that they're seeing a value in providing value and not just I whine, I get something, you know, I, I this, this is not really a, a well thought out moment here on the show, but um, I think well, that wait a lot a minute. of people, wait a minute, are any of our thoughts really well thought out <laughs> that are on this show? It's okay. We have well, a I, I digress. Yeah. Just... <laughs> but I, I do feel like there's, there's, like you were saying, there is a, um, a certain amount of people don't have to grow up, right? Like you were saying, you know, yeah. parents are taking care of them and then the government's taking care of them or the school's taking care of them and then the government's taking care of them or whatever. And I, d I don't know where this fits in because everyone, you know, there's all sorts of horrors in the world and, and bad parenting and, and children in bad homes and all these things. And so it's, it's hard to know like where these things come, come out, right? How they happen. Uh, Steph talks about, you know, like um, the prevalence of uh, spanking or, or other types of abuse will lead to higher drug, drug abuse and other, um, negative consequences later on in life. Um, but I think that, yeah, there, there is a certain style of parenting or lack of parenting that contributes more to this staying a, a child in the mind, this mindset of, of perpetual children, perpetual childhood. And yeah. so, I don't know, I, I think like libertarian type parents, if they're hearing this show, think about it and see if there's anything that you'd want to do to, uh, try to address that. I, we, we're trying to do stuff about it. Yeah, I think it's a hugely important thing that it's part of preparing your child for their future is to have them understand that there's not always going to be a nanny because they're going to take care of them. It, it's a it's a cold world sometimes. And not to say that there isn't charity and people that care about them and all that sort of thing, but you have to not just expect a handout just because you exist. Therefore, you deserve something. And that's, that's the state of nature. Uh, that's the state of nature out there. It's only through hard work that we create things that allow us to have wealth and comfort. And yeah, nature's oppressing me. You deserve it. <laughs> yeah, yes, this reminds me of um, of Crawl or Crawl, however you say the name, um, in uh, Star Trek Beyond. He was like, "You need to struggle to to be able to realize your strength or become strong." Yeah, but he was like, "You have to fight wars all the time." I mean, it's one thing to struggle and challenge yourself and to work hard. But it's another thing to get murdered in a war. I mean, come on. He's talking in the collective sense. He's like saying Star Trek, or he's saying that like the Federation is growing weak because they're not at war or something. Cause that brings mm. up the best in you. I mean, yeah, there are innovations that happen in war. Sure. Weapons. Good for you. Anyway. Yeah. Well, that sounds like this Nartsugu guy and the whole samurai class, like worrying, like what's going to happen to them in this time of peace. Like they sort of, depend on war to achieve that honor that honorable death well yeah and also and also that's kind of like their their reason for existing like you said um and not achieving an honorable death but also 
what do we need all these uh, soldiers standing around here for? If we're not at war and we're not under threat and we're on an island and nobody's coming across in boats to, you know, it's like standing armies aren't really a thing. I mean, there are now in a world perpetually at war, but um, for the Japanese in the 19th century, uh, especially the 18th and the 19th centuries, it's kind of hard to justify the expense of having a whole bunch of highly paid murderers and soldiers standing around without, you know, any threat. Yeah, so is this just a matter of, like, maybe they hadn't figured out to always have an enemy, like Orwell hadn't written in 1984 yet? Um, <laughs> they didn't have domestic terrorism yet? Yeah, whatever. yeah, they didn't have ideas to, to declare war on, drugs, poverty, terror, whatever. <laughs> yeah, I think that, yeah, it's just not as advanced a government they didn't have back then. They couldn't think of uh, of war to uh, have against an idea. You're right. Yeah, because that would have solved yeah, all what, their problems. <laughs> Oh yeah. Well, once the um, you know the uh, Europeans land and the Americans land, then they can probably you know like they did in uh, Last Samurai, they started militarizing then because they're like, well, we're a part of a bigger world and we could be attacked any time. We need to start militarizing. So that was a good uh, excuse for that. But yeah, in this time period of this movie, they didn't have that uh, didn't have that excuse at the time. Yeah. Now, now you mentioned um, guns earlier. And there is that scene where they're trying to go through um, that one guy's uh, land, uh, Makino, is that his name? Yeah, Makino. He blocks the highway, and Naritsuku's like, fuck you, dude, I'm going through. And uh, I was so hoping, I mean, it was like 40 minutes into a two-hour, 20-minute movie. But I was like, Makino, he's right there, just kill him. <laughs> kill the guy. Yeah, yeah just, just just pull the trigger, he's right there. Just, just have an empty trigger finger, just sit that second, just do it. Yeah, because all of his like uh, defenders had guns and and po- were pointing them at uh, Naritsugu, and yeah, they don't do it. Yeah, that was weird that that was the only appearance of guns in the movie. You would think that maybe the assassins could have had a gun, but I guess if they did, then maybe it would have been too easy to just shoot them. Yeah, I wonder if there was but, a um, you know samurai use swords. It's not honorable. Uh, to use very guns much so. Or something like that. I, I'm not an expert in in Japanese culture and history, so you know, take my words for what they mean or what they are. But I am an expert in some of the movies that I've seen about Japanese history and culture. And, uh, yeah, from what I, I mean, if you watch like the last samurai and I don't know how accurate this shit is, but it's what we, and I did do take some classes in, um, college about Japanese history and, um, like the book of Genji and that sort of stuff. But, um, yeah, if you watch that movie, it's all about the ancient samurai and their bows and arrows and samurai swords versus the modern gun filled army. So yeah, of that day, of that time. A, yeah, I don't know if it's necessarily a cultural like we don't believe in using guns like principally <laughs> like have a, a principle like a Batman style principle about it like all their all their parents are murdered by guns, but, but they can still uh, use missiles. Right, they can use missiles and they can use cars to smash people. It's fine, but um, or if they just felt more comfortable, you know, with bow and arrow and riding on horseback and who knows what I don't know. Yeah, now I wonder if this they was definitely another... fought differently. Because that was a time, sorry, that was a time when, um, like, Civil War time, Revolutionary War time, where you'd have regiments of soldiers just standing in rows and then firing. And then, because you had, you know, one shot each gun, right? So you had to have a guy next to you or behind you reloading for you and then handing you a new gun to shoot. Um, but the samurai, they're on horseback and they're just riding around all over the place, you know, guerrilla tactic style, like firing a bow and arrow and riding away and shit like that. So you very much... A- different culture. I, I can't see a samurai who's used to riding on a horse, firing a bow and arrow, grabbing a gun, and then standing in a line with a bunch of other guys. Maybe. Hell, I don't know. But it seems like maybe there'd be just stylistic differences. <laughs> I don't know how to explain it. I'm not an expert. I just talk about my, talk out my ass on this podcast. That's, that's what we do. But I think you do have a point because they had specialized so much in the types of things that they were doing, like the types of weaponry that they were familiar with. And so guns probably were not a part of that. And it probably could have been, you know, honor or tradition or whatever. But for whatever reason, they just weren't using them. And I think it... it yeah, and I'm not an expert again, but I know that the samurai followed the code of Bushido. And there's very strict kind of like guidelines with that. And it probably didn't mention guns, just a guess. I also so, don't think it really talked about swordplay much either. I think it was more about how you conducted yourself, how you comported yourself. But anyway. So do you think that in the context of this film, which it, it claims to have a historical you know, story that it's following, um, 
that that is also a contributing factor to the samurai sort of feeling like they don't have a place in the future? I mean, you've got this period of peace, and then there's firearms now that, that exist, and so maybe they see kind of the writing on the wall that their time of, of their specialization and their type of, of lifestyle is not really long for the world. Yeah, yeah, I think that's very much the case, it, right around this time period. So this is like, what, 1840s, and then Last Samurai, I'm guessing, is like around 1880, 1890, because um, what's-his-name, Tom Cruise, comes over after the uh, Civil War, I think, or maybe it's before the Civil War. I don't know. He's he, Apparently, he fought with Custer. So whenever Custer was running around killing people, I think it was around that time. But anyway, so yeah, right around this time, you know, this is Industrial Revolution. This is guns. This is mechanized combat. This is the uh, Gatling guns. And yeah, this is very much, a, you know, the culture's changing, too. Um, they haven't really gotten the Western influence yet, but technology's changing. And yeah, the whole peace thing. And they're just feeling out of place and they want to, maybe they look upon, maybe this, this politician guy is really tapping into a feeling that a samurai are feeling of bringing war back, that they need this sort of thing to justify their existence. And maybe they should have gone. I mean, shit. I mean, do you really want a bunch of people that all they do is war and fight and that's all they know and that's all they're good for in life? I mean, when they didn't, when they weren't fighting, they pretty much just served as bodyguards, which I have no problem with. I mean... If I was a rich man, I want some bodyguards. I'd hire some samurai, sure. Um, but they wouldn't exist, I don't think, like in an Encapistan situation, on the level of an entire nation's army's worth. I just, I just don't see the need for them. There wouldn't be the the aggression. I mean, everybody would be so wealthy. And I know that people say that, oh, we're we're <laughs> we're utopianists, but really, you would. You would be much more wealthy without fifty percent of your wealth being stolen, and you get such a small return on your investment for all that money. I mean, yeah, they make some roads and they build some infrastructure, but all that stuff could be done so much cheaper. I mean, if you look into it, with the no-bid contracts and all the <laughs> backdoor deals and all that bullshit, the cost just goes ridiculous. I mean, just ridiculous. It's like billions of dollars to make a road. Are you kidding me? Anyway, what was I talking about? <laughs> well, what the fuck was I talking about? Uh, well, it was interesting you called it an investment. I think that's being very generous. But, yeah, you're exactly right. Um, without a bunch of your money being taken from you and all the licensing and regulation and all the rest that government does to intervene in people's freely chosen decisions can only squash, it can only destroy and, and eliminate opportunities that would otherwise be there. And it's one of the worst uh, aspects of it, I mean, other than all the murdering and death that uh, governments do all the time. But Walter Block makes the point yeah. that, he, you know, he, he blames everything uh, that, that is bad on government for this simple reason. If all of these um, regulations and taxes weren't happening, then we would be so much better off, so much wealthier, so much more advanced. Things could progress so much faster scientific, scientifically, technology, whatever, that we would solve for hurricanes. We would solve for floods. We would solve for shark attacks with laser beams on their heads. You know, like these things would be solved by now. We would have cancer cured, whatever. Uh, at least that's his, you know, his take on it. Like we'd be five times more wealthy, whatever, whatever the number is. I mean, it's impossible to know. But uh, if you could just imagine like, okay, let's use five times wealthier as a, as a whole, we would have so many of these problems solved. And so the lack of those things being able to be accomplished is a direct result of all of this intervention and theft. That comes from government. Yeah, and it, like you said, it's an impossible, it's kind of a ridiculous claim, and it's impossible to prove either way, but he's not wrong in that we would be just far better off. It's impossible to know, and it's impossible to know what, what would we be doing without 50% of our wealth being stolen all the time. But you can, you can only imagine that I trust you to spend your money better than I trust some politicians to spend your money. And yeah, what... When, when, when all your needs are taken care of and with all the barriers you're talking about being put up, who knows what we would, where would we be at, what technological advances you would have without all the stupid regulations. And I'm just repeating what you just said because it's such a good point. Um, but let's get back to the movie. Um, so uh, do we have any more points to say about the movie? Um, well, I've got something. Uh, so everything. so when, when Nart, uh, Naritsugu says that the samurai... And the people, in general, have only one purpose, and that's to serve their lords. Uh, Shinzaman counters by telling that lords cannot live without the support of the people, 
And if a lord abuses his power, the people will rise against him, which is Shinzaman basically justifying his actions for attempting to kill this right. guy, right? And then there's this weird standoff where Shinzaman gets super close to him, lets Naratsugu stab him, and then he stabs yeah. Naratsugu. It's, like, fucking weird, right? Yeah, that was a weird kind of, like, tough guy. I mean, I'm probably interpreting it through my Western eyes, obviously. But it, I don't know if that was, like, a symbolic thing that he was doing or showing him. I, I didn't know what he was showing him or why he did that or he was felt like he needed to get injured by the guy for some reason. I, I'm having a hard time even saying my thoughts on this. Um, but, yeah, that, that was just weird. Um, it was obviously not necessary. The guy was some pansy, like, not pansy in a bad way, whatever. He's some useless piece of shit that had never actually fought real combat or even trained really hard, probably. And he could have just eviscerated him, probably with little effort. Um, but instead, he chose to make some sort of a point. And that point was probably lost on me. Or, well, obviously it was lost on me, but it might have not have been lost on uh, an Eastern audience member. I don't know. You know, maybe it has something to do with um, Shinzaman was an older guy and uh he wanted that honorable death and this was his way to get it like he he wanted to be injured so that he would die but then also accomplish his goal of assassinating uh the naritsugu guy well yeah i mean these guys are all about committing suicide if they feel like they've dishonored their honor broken their honor or whatever um it is interesting it was interesting to me that the um the piece of shit politician guy as he was dying he was like thanks this has been like the most interesting day of my life. Yeah, he's like or whatever. excited about it. He's like in pain and he's like, I've never felt this before. <laughs> yeah, he's like, what the hell is this? This is crazy. This is awesome. I don't know what's going on, but it's awesome. And it's also terrible. Um, yeah, maybe he was trying to kill himself. Maybe Shinzaman was like trying to go out. But at the same time, if he felt like he was dishonoring, I can't imagine. I don't think that those guys would have felt like they were dishonoring themselves. I, I it seemed like they were doing what they thought was right. So right, they weren't going to try and kill themselves. But he might have been trying to go out in the blood the glory combat style, like you're talking about, um, as like a soldier, like his last chance to die in combat, sort of thing. Right. But then also, I think that there would have been some ramifications or consequences of him breaking uh, the the code of following their leader, right? Like, he chose to defy that by murdering him, or but I think there would have been consequences to him making that decision had he had he survived the encounter. Like, I think he well, would have been Shinzaman dishonored. Shinzaman did survive, though, right? Shinzaman? Yeah, he did. He did survive. No, no, he died. And then his um, his nephew, I think, is the one who wanders through all the carnage and then meets the um, risen from the dead Lazarus-style uh, hunter guy who got stabbed in the neck during the battle oh, and, like, got okay. speared and was, like, dead. And then... <laughs> He's like jumping around at the end, like, "Oh, hey, <laughs> that was so, just some battle." <laughs> yeah, and I took that as some sort of a fantastical like element that I mean, a lot of Japanese stuff has like magical type elements and like forest spirits and things like that. And I, I thought that he was some sort of a forest spirit or something like that because he talks about yeah, yeah, how like bears bears hurt a lot harder than stupid samurai and how wimpy they are. But um, yeah, so then at the end of the movie. I'm surprised this movie thing is this long to talk about, but I guess we have thoughts. Um, uh, yeah, the, uh, to save face, the guy is what, he doesn't show up, right? Obviously his whole group is dead, but in order to save face, they say he died of like sickness or illness, and then it's just all kind of swept under the rug about what actually happened. Yeah, the Naritsuga guy, yeah, they, they say that he got sick and died on his journey. Yeah, right. So not that he was a piece of shit and he died for a reason, but yeah, he just got sick and died. What a, how sad. Yeah. Well, All of a sudden, there's there's a significant drop in rapes and dismemberments. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All of a sudden, the, the peasant population is doing a lot better. Yeah. So that's pretty much the movie. I, I know we kind of dived in and out of this one a fair amount, but uh, what do you think, man? What's your uh, what's your overall assessment of the film and your rating? Uh, it's this is a tough one for me to um, evaluate. On the one hand, you know, Shinzaman is doing a very courageous act. And saying that he's gonna, you know, protect other people by, you know, and killing and punish this other guy for his horrific crimes. Basically just saying, hey, we don't want this piece of shit around killing everybody. So we'll kind of take it upon himself to go against the grain and whatever. Or at least he gets this order from this other guy and is, like accepts it wholeheartedly. Um, but at the same time, I'm like, man, does this movie kind of perpetuate the belief in authority? Cause all these people are willing to live and die for this 
piece of shit. So, I mean, yeah, those are the quote unquote villains and the heroes are the good guys that recognize the bad guys for what they are. Um, man, it's complex. It gets muddy, you know, with government. But at the end, I, I guess I'm going to give this a black and gold because I think that the, the hero elements and the resistance to this really powerful, really powerful social control um, is an impressive uh, statement and act by the Shinzeman guy and the group of the 13 assassins, even though it's called 13 assassins. I can't imagine the original title is assassins in maybe it just seems like, I mean, assassin doesn't have the best connotation. You know what I mean? If you're talking about a bunch of heroes, you don't call them assassins, but I guess that's what they are. So in a way, but anyway, yeah, uh, I'll give it black gold. Um, acting pretty good. It's hard for me to evaluate people not speaking English. Um, but you know, it is what it is. The action was pretty good. A little bit, not the greatest, but fine. Um, cinematography, direction, all that stuff is, you know, serviceable, but nothing really stood out for me as being fantastic. Um, but overall, overall strong. I'd recommend it. Um, as long as, you know, as long as you notice the horrific, you know, all the problems that this belief in authority gets you. That's all I have. Please. You, Daniel? Yeah, well, I mean, all the things you said. Uh, this was a movie I actually picked out of the voodoo because it was on sale, and I was like, oh, this is probably something Robert would like. And then I discovered that it's not one of the UV titles, uh, which is the only kind that we're able to share with each other. So I'm glad that we were able to watch it while you were up here. Um, I thought it was entertaining. It it was a bit convoluted at the beginning, um, so it was hard to follow uh, what was going on. There were a lot of... Oh, wait, yeah, just sorry to interrupt you, but yes, um, the movie throws a lot of Japanese names at you right off the get-go. Yeah. Without really like giving you this 15 is this 15 or 20 character. people, and you're like, all right, what? <laughs> yeah, like, now who's talking about what now and what's going on where and who? It's like, yeah, it takes a while to even understand what's happening. I'd say the first, like, 10, 15 minutes is like, huh? But, okay, yeah, go ahead, sorry. Yeah, yeah, so I was, like, all confused initially, and, and I think um, I even mentioned it to you. I had to run in and help with the kids for a second or something. I was like, dude, do you even know what's going on here? <laughs> and yeah. and it, it didn't help that, um, and this is going to sound terrible, but a lot of the people in the movie, they had the same clothing and the same top knot like, hairstyle. It was really hard to distinguish them apart. And they so, all look the same to you, Daniel. They all look the same to me. <laughs> I know, I know, <laughs> terrible. But... Uh, so that made the setup kind of hard to follow. I mean, I got the gist of it, you know, like, oh, this guy's really fucking bad, and they show him doing really terrible shit, like murdering right. that family in this courtyard and just basically torturing them, right? Like arrows in legs and then and then the arms and then killing them. You know, he was, like, doing yeah. it for sport and for sadistic pleasure. And right. they were clearly making him out to be, you know, as evil as possible in the film. And he may have been, I don't know. I don't know how historically accurate it is, but it certainly does make you hate the guy. And it makes watching the rest of the movie so frustrating because you're like, oh, my God, you're right there. Just kill him or do something about this, you know? Like, don't allow this to happen. <laughs> There's so many moments in the movie, you're like, it could end right now. You could just do it right now. But, again, you know, you can't tell uh, tell the whole story in, in 10 minutes in, right? You can't just end it. Otherwise, it's not a movie. But, uh Related to the things you were talking about, I thought the action scenes were, were really good, if a little hokey. I thought that their um, contraptions and traps um, weren't quite as spectacular as I thought they would be, like or as destructive. I, I kind of thought that buying the whole town and, and setting these traps ahead of time would have been more effective. Uh, but, you know, the action was cool. The, the badass swordsman guy was was a badass swordsman guy. Like, he was just mowing through people. And whenever he got on screen with that sword out, you're, like, excited to see what he's going to do. You know, it was like watching Wolverine uh, in Logan, like, rip the claws out and start, you know, hacking away at the <laughs> at those carjacker dudes, you know? Oh, yeah. Um, but it also was a yeah. little bit... Go ahead. No, I, I was just going to reiterate. Yeah, he's like the, the Clint Eastwood, just badass. Like, you want to see him just unleash hell. And so, you're, yeah, you're rooting for him to just, just start mowing through peeps. Um but yeah, he, there's one good scene where he really does that. And there's probably a few scenes where he does it a little bit. And then there's one kind of like super scene where he does it a whole bunch where it's, it's kind of weird because he set up all these swords all around this area. Like I'm going to use these swords exactly perfectly to kill these guys at this specific point. But it, there's never a really good reason for why he needed the swords because he slashes a guy with a sword. And then for some reason he just kind of drops it and then grabs it for another sword. It's like, why did he drop it? Why didn't you just keep holding on to that one sword? That one sword seemed perfectly fine. I don't understand. He doesn't like throw the sword and like impale a guy against the thing 
or have the sword break on him. I mean, they were talking about katanas here. They're not going to break. But anyway, that was just a little little quibbling. Yeah, yeah. And then, you know, my my little bit of quibbling, which I was about to get to, was that it seemed like the assassins, when, when they were killing them off, it, it felt like in Rogue One where they just had to kill them off to kill them off. You know, all the, all the characters. Yes. And it yes. felt a little cheap, a lot of them. I mean, they tried to do it a little bit different and inventive for a few of them, but yeah, I, it just felt a little ham-fisted, I guess. Yeah, like they survived all these crazy things, and then they just die like at this point. And you're like, okay, so you just you just didn't want him to live. <laughs> right, yeah. He just yeah, had to die. You, you only wanted like one or two survivors, so these guys have to die. Yeah, I, I know what you mean. Like they just kind of seemed to have had to die for some reason. Mm-hmm. Right, and they didn't lose any of the guys right away. It was all after they'd already kicked some serious ass, you know? And so it was like, wait a minute, they're <laughs> overmatching these, you know, 600, 800, 1,000 guys. I know it said it was 200, but man, you watch this movie. Someone should actually take the time and go and count how many how many uh, enemies are in this thing because there's way more than 200. <laughs> yeah, but, but yeah, like you said, he's mowing through. They've already established that these guys are like really good swordsmen, so they're mowing through a bunch of people. And then... You get to a point where it's just like where they got to start killing people off. So they just kind of do not for any particular reason, but just because they need to die for time considerations. <laughs> Almost. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And I feel like they should have red donned it a little bit. You know, like you lose a couple at different points in, in the movie or in the battle. Right. Like a few initially when you're outnumbered, uh, overwhelmed. Um, I don't know. Yeah, it just felt a little cheap. Anyway, I digress. Uh, but other than that, I mean, those are minor quibbling things. I really enjoyed the movie. I liked seeing the um, the internal struggle with Shinzaman with, you know, his code of honor and then deciding that this guy is so evil that despite this code of honor, I'm going to make a decision to deal with this. And, you know, I think that's a that's a powerful message. Like you don't have to fall into what the authority tells you. You are your individual. Like you were saying earlier, people have self-ownership. You can make your own decisions. And I think that 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 is a very strong message to have. So I'm, I'm black and gold all the way on this baby. Sweet. Well, I think we should wrap it up, and then maybe we could do a little bit of overdrive, and I can rant about some things, or unless you want to tack on to the end of this thing. Oh, uh, let's let's some turn the frogs game. Ranting about some crap. We'll turn the you frogs game right now. No, no, we'll, let's let's end the show, and then we'll do okay. the overdrive. Maximum Kathleen over overdrive. Kathleen Turner overdrive. All right. All right. Well, hey everyone, this has been uh, episode 38 of the Actual Energy Podcast about 13 Assassins. A uh, really cool movie, as you just heard for I don't know how long we've been talking. Uh, if you want to support the work that we do here, it's actualanarchy.com slash tipjar. This episode and show notes can be found at actualanarchy.com slash 38. And um, appreciate you joining us. Appreciate you being a supporter. Um, your comments and your likes and shares and ratings and all of that would be greatly appreciated. Uh, keeps us motivated to keep doing this. And um, I just say good night. We're going to move into overdrive right after this. I'm going to uh, Robert, you can say a few words, and then we will end the show officially and then turn the frog skate. Well, here's a few words for you all, people. Just live free. Thanks for listening. Thanks for your support. We, we do appreciate everything you do. And uh, just uh, keep contributing to a more free world. We appreciate it. Thanks for listening. Oh, yeah. You know, and one more bonus thing I want to add is that um, if you like our content, you are sure to love a few of our friends, libertyweekly.net, Battle for Liberty, and libertarianism for normal people they all have shows they all have websites really good stuff uh, we've been guests they've been guests so do check them out support them so it helps spread the message of liberty and freedom and anarchy so good night Chipmunks. C H I P M U N K. We're the chipmunks. Guaranteed to brighten your day. Do 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 do